chapter 2. Now, you notice the title on the screen, it says, We Are Not Drunk. Um, amen? Alright, I just want to make sure. I didn't know what all y'all did last night. Um, when you see someone who is drunk, they have a certain amount of swag, a certain boldness to them, where they are liable to say or do anything. I have seen many people over the years of my life that have been emboldened by several different guys from Tennessee. Um, fellas named Jack and Jim and folks like that. And they were, they were willing to do things like jump into a campfire. Um, you know, other things of that nature. Uh, say whatever, do whatever, eat whatever. Um, when you are drunk, that means that you are impaired and something is different about you. So, we should remember that drunk is not always about being drunk with alcohol, but it can be a good drunk. Okay? Um, we are not drunk on the wine, but we should be drunk on the Spirit. When the Spirit of God fell on the church at Pentecost, it caused some things to happen. A wind came and there was a fire that uh, landed on them and they started speaking in various languages that were not their own. They were acting as though they were drunk. That's what the people thought. It says in the book of Acts, chapter 2, um, if you look on down in verse 13, it says they've had too much wine. <laughs> so Peter stands up and he decides to address the crowd. It says here in verse 14, Peter stood up with the eleven, he raised his voice and he addressed the crowd and he said, Fellow Jews, and all of you who live in Jerusalem, let me explain this to you. Listen carefully to what I say. These people are not drunk, as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. Now, understand this. The time of day has never been much different to someone who was uh, drunk on the wine. Um, a lot of people wake up drunk that were going to bed drunk. And drunk was just a state of being. They were just a drunk. I mean, y'all remember that old drunk, what was his name, Otis from the Andy Griffith show? He was known as the town drunk. He was always drunk. Just who he was. I wonder what it would be like if we had more church members were known as the church drunk. And not for alcohol reasons, but because of our boldness, our ability to, to say and do whatever may, may seem different. Or uh, like, whoo, something done got a hold of that one. What would be wrong with that? Well, Peter said, these people are not drunk as you suppose. It's only nine in the morning. And then he decides to tell these Jewish people and everyone who is around what the prophet Joel said. And you can read this word for word in Joel chapter 2, verse 28 through 32. Um, and Peter says this, In the last days, God says, I will pour out my Spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will have dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my Spirit in those days. It says, they will prophesy. I will show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. 
everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, I want you to understand the context of what Peter is talking about here. These Jewish folks that were gathered together here at Pentecost, they needed to understand that the old mosaic way of doing things, the old covenant that they were under, the Abraham covenant, the the blessed people of Israel covenant, the, the law of Moses was over. There was fixing to be the last, as it's called, dispensation, which is like dispensing, like handing out or squirting out stuff. The last dispensation of grace is about to take place. And it's called the church age. So the age of of the Jewish law being the law of God is now fulfilled. It is now over. There's coming a new time. A new way of things are about to take place. And people are going to look drunk. Because now they're not only going to be trying to follow a set of rules or follow the laws, but now they're going to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's going to make you talk different. It's going to make you look different. It's going to make you act different. When you get filled with the Holy Spirit, it moves you. It changes you. It shakes things up a little bit. And that's quite all right. How many times do you get hung up on trying your best to not look too holy? I'm serious. Ask yourself this question. When was the last time it came to your mind that you were looking a little too holy? Somebody might look at you as though you were weird or strange. If that has ever bothered you, then shame, shame. The devil knows your name. Bringing God glory, that's kind of our purpose in life. Well, not even kind of. It is. But so often... We as church folk are reserved in letting the Holy Spirit just bust loose. Peter is saying to these folks here, in the last days, the last days of your old ways, He is going to pour His Spirit out on all people. Not just to you Jews, but to all people. When God said whosoever, it was for every single person, Jew and Gentile. So in the last days, God's kingdom was about to be filled with a new way of things. When Jesus said, I am creating a new covenant in my blood, this new way was about to fall down on the earth. Forty years after Jesus Christ, the Jewish people were, they were done. There were still Jewish people, but their nation of Israel was defeated by the Romans. They were pretty much done in. Their old uh, mosaic way of following laws and having temple and all that was done. The temple was destroyed, and it started on the cross. When Jesus breathed His last breath and He said, it is finished, He was signifying that the old way is finished. And Peter here is standing up and saying, "Uh, my fellow Jews and everybody here, listen, the old way has changed. It's not like this anymore. So this old way is gone. The Levitical priesthood where all the, the, the tribe of the Levites were the ones that were the high priests, that's over with now. That's not the way it's going to be anymore. He said, from now on, there's going to be young men having having visions. Old men are going to dream dreams. There are going to be people speaking in tongue, not just men, but women also. Everybody is fixing to be filled with the Holy Spirit of God. That means everybody who accepts Jesus as their Savior is going to be moved and changed. And they're going to, quite frankly, they're going to look drunk to everybody that is not involved. They're going to look a little different. When's the last time you were around somebody that was um, a little too religious for your liking? Hmm? 
come on now. It, it might have been a minute, but you still get uncomfortable when you're around some real religious people, don't you? Do they make you feel bad that, that uh, you're not as holy as they are? Or does it make you uncomfortable with their level of righteousness? Like, come on now, I love Jesus too, but we ain't got to be all weird about it. Hmm? You know somebody that, that makes you feel like that? So what's wrong with them? Or is it what's wrong with you? I would, I would like to see you out holy somebody this week. I'm talking about if somebody comes up and they say to you, Ooh, praise God, it's a good day. Well, you look right back at them and you say, Absolutely, hallelujah! What's wrong with that? I'm talking about scare them. Scare them with the holiness. If you feel that way. Now, if you don't feel that way, don't try to act like a Christian. You've got to be one. If the Holy Ghost is inside of you, let Him out. Let Him out. The old way of things, I think, would better suit the churches nowadays. The Old Testament way, where we had a set bunch of rules, and then one day a year we could make atonement for our sin. We would take it as where we can live however we want to live all 364 days of the year, and then on that one day of atonement we would go to church, we would make amends, and we would please God, and we would fulfill the law, and therefore we would be holy. Maybe we break it down a little bit more. We go to church, you know, once a week. Once a week, um, that would please God. Maybe we tithe, that would please God. And uh, You know, we follow in a set of rules, and it's just easier to be a Christian that way, isn't it? If you're just following a certain set of rules and expectations. But when you start letting the Holy Spirit get involved and He starts moving on you, it changes things. Peter is telling these folks here, y'all, the, the last days of the old ways are here. It's not going to be like that anymore. It's no longer going to be where you have to follow a set of rules in order to be righteous. You're going to be changed and saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And if you are... The Holy Spirit is going to live inside of you and your sons and daughters are going to prophesy. The, the young men are going to see visions of what God has called them to do. The older men are going to dream dreams about what God is calling them to do. And on my servants, both men and women, I'm going to pour out my Spirit on those, all of them. So there's, there's no reason why anybody would ever have an excuse to not let the Holy Spirit move. Because if you have invited the Holy Spirit to live inside of you, then you might as well let Him make Himself comfortable. Case in point, how many of y'all have ever used this line when you have company? Company comes over and you tell them, make yourself at home. If they... <clears throat> If they went and jumped in your bed, you wouldn't be comfortable. Like, yes, I will. And I'm going to sit in your chair. I'm going to drink the last cup of your tea. And then I'm going to go and lay down in your bed and take a nap. I'm going to make myself at home. I'm going to stink up your bathroom. I'm going to turn the thermostat down. <clears throat> really, whatever I want to do. You said, make myself at home, right? Well, when we ask the Holy Spirit to come and live inside of us, you got to understand something. That will only happen. He will only indwell once you surrender your life to Him. It's like, I am giving myself to you. I cannot get to heaven. I cannot be forgiven without you. So I'm surrendering my life to you. Will you please live inside of me? And when you do that, it doesn't matter about anybody else. It doesn't matter what anybody else thinks. 
You are living for God. So you're letting him make himself at home. But do you, do you like put some rules on it? Do you put some limits on it? Church, the world needs to see Jesus living in us right now. They need to see the church being moved by the Holy Spirit right now. They need to see that we are not just the same as people outside living in the world. They need to see how the Holy Spirit moves through us and has changed us. The world needs to see Jesus now more than ever. Well, Peter went on and he told these people, he says, this is what God says, I will show wonders in the heaven. Signs on earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. Now let me tell you something. All of this sounds like some revelation type stuff, but it's not. All of this took place around 40 A.D. or around 70 A.D., 40 years after Jesus Christ. And this is, this is what happened from the history book. And if you want to read about this, you can read in the, uh, the Antiquities of the Jews by a guy named Josephus. Um, he wrote down a lot of the history of the Jews around 70 A.D. Uh, Flavius Josephus was his full name. And what had happened during that time that Jerusalem was being um, overtaken and destroyed by the Romans there was a comet in the sky. And this was like a fire in the sky that, y'all remember seeing a comet before, how it didn't really move? It was just there? Well, the comet was there, and that was that wonder in heaven that he was talking about. And the signs on the earth below, like fire and billows of smoke, that was the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans. And he was telling these people, Everything that you know is fixing to be destroyed. Everything is fixing to be wiped out. And the sun will be turned to darkness. There was an eclipse. The moon had this, uh, um, you know how moon looks when the eclipse happens. And about it turning red, it was because of all the bloodshed that was about to take place. Um, and all of that was going to happen before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And that was the last days that he mentioned in verse 17. In the last days, the last days of life as you know it, things are changing. <clears throat> well, I know that in preaching through the book of Revelation and also just preaching through the Bible, telling people that it is appointed unto man once to die, and then after that is the judgment. That's what the Bible says, right? <clears throat> when a person dies, well then, there is no more chance at redemption. When it's over, it's over. Okay? So, that's why the Bible says that today is the day of salvation. If you feel like there is something keeping you from being saved, what is that? What is keeping you from experiencing the joy of salvation? What's keeping you from being holy? And what's keeping you from letting the Holy Spirit live through you? What is that thing? What is that sin? What is that problem? What is it? Is it pride? Is it embarrassment? Is it, is it I'm, I'm too self-conscious? I'm, I'm not comfortable with it. I'm not knowledgeable enough. I don't know. I don't know how to be. I don't know who I am. I don't know what to do. I mean, what is the problem? What's the problem? You're going to live a last day. And on that last day, if it's today, if today is your last day, what do you need to make amends with God about? What do you need to repent of? What do you need to say, God, I'm sorry, I don't like this, I don't need this, I don't want this in my life anymore. What do you need to change? That was Peter's plea with these people. Like, people, listen to me. Life as you know it is over. It's going to end. The old way of doing things has changed. 
the way you've been living, you can't go that way no more. It's over. Now, I'm telling you this today. If there is sin in your heart, sin in your life, sin in your home, you can't live like that anymore. You cannot. You can't live like that and be close to God. You can't live like that and bring glory to God. You just can't. You can't be a good witness. God's going to pour His Spirit out on men and women, all people. You're going to start having visions and dreams and, and you're going to start seeing things when you let the Holy Spirit make Himself at home. Now, if something's keeping you from doing that, you're not giving God full glory. You're not giving Him full reign. Something is wrong. And folks, that is the epitome of revival taking that which used to be on fire, which used to be um, full of the Holy Spirit, and getting whatever is in the way out of the way. Do you want to see Jesus working in your life in a, in a unique, powerful way, a, a way better than He ever has before? Do you want more of Jesus today than, than you've ever had Him? Do you want more of the, the Holy Spirit? Do you want more conviction? Do you want to feel closer to God? Do you want to be the holy one in the room? What's keeping you from that? Confess that to God today. Peter wound up, he said, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone. It's available to all. You call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. If you've never been saved, you just have to call on the name of the Lord. Jesus, I believe in you. I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I have sinned in my heart and my life. I want to be forgiven. And you will be forgiven today. The church, Christians, we need to be on fire. The church should be on fire, just like the fire that fell at Pentecost and landed on every single person's head and caused them to start speaking in tongues and moving around and doing things and witnessing and prophesying. I'm not saying that you're going to automatically start telling the future and having visions and dreams, um, but the Holy Spirit is going to have His way. And you will start seeing people changed around you. You will start seeing your home changed. Your marriage changed. Your relationship changed. You'll start seeing things different. There will be more positivity in your life. There will be more, more, uh, more holiness in, in your house. And that's what we need now. We can have that. Church, please don't leave here today with something still wrong in your heart. All right, you, you don't got to. If there's anything that you need forgiveness for or to confess to Jesus, take this time to do that. We're going to sing an invitational hymn. I want you to be revived today. I want you to be as close to Jesus as you can be today. So if you would call on the name of the Lord in prayer, if you want to fall on your knees at the altar, you can do that. But... Whatever is in your heart that you need to get out of the way, do it right now and be filled with the Holy Spirit, all right?